Thank you, Leah. I'm Patrick, and I'm going to discuss on the issues for question 2a, 2b, and 2c. For question 2a, the first issue is whether Dawn is liable for the offence of criminal intimidation by assaulting the waiter and leaving without payment. Crime in criminal intimidation is specified in section 24 of the Crime Order ordinance with the actus risk summarized in subsection A to C and the mens risk summarized in subsection 1 to 3. Dawn's wording towards the waiter had constituted the actus risk of threatening other person with injury to the person verbally under subsection A with the words, I will chop you into many pieces and had constituted the mens risk of causing the person so threatened to omit to do any act which he is legally entitled to do under subsection 3 by saying, don't you dare make me pay all of that. With the waiter's reactions of chopping the bill into many pieces, it is believed that the waiter did not fully understand Stone's threat in English. However, under section 26, there is no defense to prove that the threat did not reach the victims as long as the threat was made in some manner with the intention that it should reach the person whom it was intended. With the knowledge of Dawn's violence temper, the case of Lo Tong Kwai and the Queen, which was adopted by Hong Kong SAR and Lo Kwok Lam, stated that wild and wearing words which were not spur of the moment with no further criminal actions does not constitute the mens risk of criminal intimidation. However, the fact that Don left without payment at the end would prevent him of using the cases for his defence. Don may also seek defence with voluntary intoxication as his wife left early and Don had finished a bottle of wine on his own. However, Cadwell had divined that voluntary intoxication shall not apply to basic intent or recklessness offence. In conclusion, Don would be liable for the summary conviction of criminal intimidation. An alternative verdict for Don would be the making of without payment as stated in section 18c subsection 1 or assault with the intent to rob as stated in section 10 subsection 2 of theft ordinance. The second issue is on whether Enid is liable for the offence of making off without payment by leaving the restaurant without payment. This offence has to satisfy three elements. First, knowing that payment on the spot for any goods supplied or service done is required or expected from him. Second, dishonestly makes off and thirdly, with intent to avoid payment of the amount due. So, for the first element, in Crown and Brooks, it specified the elements that departures from the spot where payment is required and in it leaving would fulfill this requirement. On the second element, Crown and Gosch defines dishonesty to be according to the ordinary standards of reasonable and honest people. And whether D realized that what he was doing was by those standards dishonest. Here it is believed that Enid was not dishonest to the restaurants when leaving. Lastly, on the third point, Crown and Allen set out the intention of never to pay is required, and here Enid would believe that Dawn would be responsible for the bill after she has left. Referring to Crown and Brooks, it is also arguable for the location and time on the requirement of departures from the spots where payments are required. In this case, Enid was in a hotel restaurant, and meals can usually be put on the tab until checkouts from the hotel. So in conclusion, Inet is not will not be reliable for the offence of making off without payment. Moving on to the next issue, 
Whether Dawn is liable for the offence of criminal damage to the door locked of room 99. Section 60, subsection 1 of the Crimes Ordinance reads, A person who, without lawful excuse, destroys or damages any properties belongs to another, intending to destroy or damage such property or being reckless as to whether any such property would be destroyed or damaged, shall be guilty of an offence. The actor's risk of this offence focus on the results of the damage. Referring to section 59 subsection 1 and 2, the door lock is a property which belongs to the hotel. Any guests, including Dawn, only have the rights to use the lock with a contractual relationship. In Burrow and Kingley, smearing mud on police station walls was constitute a criminal damage, even though it was a like slightly scratched. Dawn's damage would meet the required actor's risk. For the man's risk, Crown and Miller specified a general duty to prevent harm, and Crown and G and R further defines recklessness as first, a circumstance when he is aware of the risk that it exists or will exist. Second, a result when he is aware of a risk that it will occur and it is in the circumstances known to him and reasonable to take the risk. With reference to Miller and GNR, the test on men's risk of recklessness shall be a subjective test. In this case, it is considered that Don did not intend to damage the door lock by using the car key. So, in conclusion, Don should be not liable for the offence of criminal damage. However, Don may be liable for damage under tort law. The next last issue on question 2a would be on whether Don is liable for the offence of burglary of necklace in room 99. Burglary is a two-step offence as stated in section 11 subsection 1a and subsection 1b. There must be entries as a trespasser with ulterior intent or an entry as a trespasser and doing one of the specified events, in this case the stealing of the necklace. Don's belief it was his own room means his offence falls under section 11 subsection 1b which reads Having entered any building or part of the building as a trespasser, he steals or attempts to steal anything in the building or that part of it or inflict or attempts to inflict any, on any person there in any grievous bodily harm. Don's intention to steal only emerged after he entered the room and saw the necklace. Another element of burglary is trespassing, which means a person not welcome within the building and no or reckless not welcome inside with men's risk requirement. Although Dawn is a guest and allowed to enter the hotel building. Crown and Walkington held that the defendant entering another part of building not permitted for his entering would amount to trespassing. The second step of burglary is stealing. Theft Ordinance Section 2 Subsection 1 defines that a person is guilty of theft if he dishonestly appropriates properties belonging to another with the intention of permanently deriving the other of it. And theft and steal shall be construed accordingly. Crown and Gomez held that any interference with properties belongs to another would amount to an appropriation irrespective of whether the owner consented or authorized the act in question. By picking up a ne necklace from room 99, Don appropriates the properties belongs to others. Therefore, theft was constituted. Under section 7 subsection 1, obtaining properties means dishonestly appropriates properties belonging to another with the intention of permanently depriving of the other of it. Theft Ordinance Section 2 Subsection 2 further states that it is immaterial whether the appropriation is made with a view to gain or is made for the theft owns benefits. So ultimately, giving the likeness to 
in it, a gift would not be an excuse. For the actor's risk, Section 4, Subsection 1 amounts to an appropriation innocently or not. Subse section 6, Subsection 1 specified the loss of control of the properties. Lawrence and MPC further defines property which shall be regarded as belonging to an now, any person having possession or control of it or having it in any proprietary rights or interests. Here it is the fact that the owner lost control of the likeness after it was taken by Dawn. The mens risk of theft shall be referred to section 7, subsection 1 and subsection 2, which apply to a person in possession of control of another properties who dishonestly and for his own purpose deals with that property in such a manner that he knows that he is risking its loss as I suggested in Fernando's. Crown and Grosch divine dishonesty to be according to the ordinary standards of reasonable and honest person and whether D realized that what he was doing was by those standards dishonest. In this case, Don's Actions and men's risk would fulfill the Gosh test. In conclusion, Don would be liable for burglary. Other verdict for the burglary would be whether Inet amounts to theft by receiving the necklace from Don. Under the Theft Ordinance Section 4, Subsection 2, states that where properties or are rights of interest or is or reports to be transferred for value, a person acting in good faith. No later assumption by him of rights which he believed himself to be occurring shall, by reason of any defects in the transferor's title, amount to theft of the properties. In Crown and Adams, the defendants became aware of that motorcycle parts were stolen after purchase and possession. It was held that the defendant was innocent as he had no knowledge at the time of the purchase. So for this scenario, it would depend whether Enet knew that the necklace was stolen by Dawn when he gave the necklace to her. Moving on to question 2b. Here the issues would be whether Dawn is liable for the offence of robbery of threads, jackets and wallets in Broom 77. Section 10 provides of the theft ordinance provides that first, a person is guilty of robbery if he steals and immediately before or at the time of doing so, and in order to do so he uses force on any person or puts or seeks to put any person in fear of being then and there subjected to force. Second, any person who commits robbery or an assault with intent to rob shall be guilty of an offence and shall be liable on conviction upon indictment to imprisonment of life. Forrester defines that robbery is the physical use of force or attempt to make victim fear or fear force of for the theft. Forrester also held that every element of theft must be proved for guilt of robbery or the possibility of attempt robbery where one of the more elements are not proven. In this case, it was proven under the previous issue that burglary by Dawn and that he had constituted dishonesty, appropriating property belonging to another and with the intent to permanently derive from it. Chen Xiuming also puts the requirement on whether the victim was still in fear when the stealing occurred and does the defendant think the victim is still in fear. For this case, Don has broken Fred's arm and it would be reasonable to assume Fred would be still in fear when Don steals Fred's jackets and wallet. In Don's defense, Skilvington held that there was no theft and therefore no robbery for obtaining his wife's wages without dishonesty. It is possible to argue that Don does not realize he was in his own, wasn't in his 
own room, as Enid was in the room. As such, he was only taking his own jacket and wallet. However, in conclusion, John may not be liable for robbery through defence with Skillington. Moving on to the last question, question 2c. The issue here is whether John is liable for the offence of wounding or inflicting grievously bodily harm. Under the Offence Against the Person Ordinance, Section 19, any person who unlawfully and maliciously wound or inflicts any GBH upon any other person, either with or without any weapons or instruments, shall be guilty of wounding or inflicting GBH. Section 19 can refer to a battery in common law and are under common law offence in Hong Kong. The actus reus requires proof for infliction of unlawful personal violence upon another person. In this case, there is no doubt on threats broken arm by dawn. The mens risk of battery is intention to inflict unlawful person violence or the Cunningham recklessness. However, a person is le legally entitled to use force under specific circumstances. For Dawn's case, the lawfulness of the infliction of force may fall under 1. In circumstances of necessity, 2. By way of lawful correction, and 3. In self-defense and crime prevention, which was explained in Bradford and Crown. It would be for Dawn to tender evidence suggesting that the infliction of force was in the circumstances lawful. Once Dawn alleged that he was legally entitled to use force, it is for the prosecution to prove beyond reasonable doubt that the force was unlawful or reckless. The Crime Procedure Ordinance Section 101A stated that a person may use such force as is reasonable in the circumstances in the prevention of crime or in affecting or assisting in the lawful arrest of the offender or suspected offenders or for persons unlawfully at large. Crime Procedure Ordinance Section 101 Subsection 2 also reads, any person may arrest without warrant any person whom he may reasonably reasonably suspect of being guilty of an arrestable offence. In this case, Don believed Fred was an intruder who was indecently assaulting Enid. Self-defence can be referred here as Don and Enid have special relationship as they are married, which was discussed in Delphi. In William, Don may still be entitled to rely on his mistaken belief to avoid criminal liability arising from the use of force. William also lied down the principles on the reasonable degree of force and conclude that a person may use such force as is reasonable in the circumstances as he honestly believed them to be in the defence for himself or another. So to conclude for these issues, Don may not be liable for GBH through defence on self-defence and crime prevention. This is the end of our presentation. Thank you very much.